College, again, depending on what you're going after, right? Depending on what you're wanting. If you're in the STEMs, then great, go for it. Uh, if you want to run a business, you don't need to go to university or college to run a business. You think that you could skip college and still be a successful business owner just if you go straight into the workforce? Yeah, today's day and age, yes. Look, how much knowledge is out on the internet right now? I mean, like, I went to univer I went to college in 2003, okay? So you kind of date myself a little bit, but, you know, <clears throat> Google was barely there. You couldn't just pull out your phone and Google something in quest for knowledge. You had to go learn it. So, okay, there was a time maybe at that time to be able to do that. But so much of what I know in running my business hasn't actually come from my textbooks. It's come from real world it's experience. Came from All right, it's came from real world experience. What's going on, everybody? And welcome to season two of Legacy's Journey, where we talk about creating what outlives you. I'm your host, Cameron Williams, owner of Kinley Consulting, where we focus on strategic financial growth for marketing agencies so that they can live the dream life they deserve and work hard for and not be a slave to their business. And we do that through CFO and consulting services. Now, today's guest. Now, you know, I told y'all season two, we're, we're doing it bigger. These are all agencies that are on the road to either a million dollars or they're already making a million dollars and they're ready to just share their story, how it can help you, don't do this, etc. So, you know, I had to reach into the network and I'm like, y'all, I need some people that are legit, like top tier people with top tier stuff to offer. And so, you know, one of my buddies, Karen, you may or may not have heard of the episode yet. She's like, you need to talk to, to, to that. And I'm like, all right, cool. Make the connection. So here, Representing Canada, we got Thaddeus Tondu on the podcast. What's going on, brother? Hey, Cameron, not too much. A little cold today, but not uh, nothing that us Canadians aren't used to. Uh-uh, it's too cold. Too cold. All right, so tell them. Tell them your name, name of the company, how long you've been at it, and just give us like some of what you do and how you help people. Yeah, great. Um, so Thaddeus Tondu uh, with On Purpose Media. We also have a podcast, HVAC Success Secrets Revealed. Uh, so no stranger to being on uh, podcasts. We've been in business, well, j actually almost four years. Uh, well, four over four years ago is when we ended up buying our, our domain. And uh, I quit my job uh, coming up almost four years ago. Uh, so dove right into the agency and, and we're focusing on helping um, home service companies with a flair for HVAC and plumbing or HVAC, depending on where you're from and how you want to say it, heating and cooling companies rather, uh, if you want to go that route. And we help them through website design, uh, SEO and PPC to be able to help grow their business. And that's really the essence of what we're focusing on. But when I think about our, our core mission, um, I didn't ask you if I could swear on your podcast, so I hope I can. Uh, but uh, when we look at our purpose, let's it's, try to keep it to a minimum. Okay, I'll say it once because this is part of our purpose and our mission. Okay, it's fuck conventional people first digital marketing, and that's really what we're after to be able to look at how can we then take our team and impact their lives, but also how can we impact our clients' lives and help them build a legacy for their families, and that's really what you know our our purpose is uh, with inside of our company. Okay, and that, that lines up perfectly, talking about legacies with the clients. Okay, now, you said you've been doing this four years. In four years, digital marketing has changed a lot, ironically. What are some of those things that you've seen, like, this changed in a good way versus, like, I don't know why they did this, but this is part of doing business now? <laughs> the easiest one is Facebook to Meta. Hey, that's when we started... We started as a, well. We started as a general estate agency. We didn't have a clue what we were doing. We bought a, a social media marketing 2.0 course by Ty Lopez, and there's nothing wrong with that course. It's got a great bunch of information, but it doesn't give you all the tools necessary. So we dove deep, and Facebook was one of the best ways that we were able to generate revenue for our clients. Now a lot has changed in the last four years. A lot more people are coming involved and getting into the space uh, with it, and the 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 biggest change and so that's kind of been for the, the the worst for a lot of individuals i think for the better is the advent of ai in looking at something like a chat gbt or a bard what they're doing with gemini and that allows businesses agencies specifically 
to be smarter with their time to be able to get more done with less. Okay, there you go. All right, so let's backtrack a little bit. So, okay, you've been at this for years. So let's talk a little bit about childhood because we've seen that like, there's typically two paths. There's the people who like my parents, I ain't gonna lie, they're pretty well off. So I've always seen money, think about it abundantly, you know, it's no big deal. Versus there are some people who are like, man, I knew not to ask my parents because I knew money was tight. And that kind of gave me some struggles as an adult and as I started my business. Tell us which one you fall into. And then now that you're, of course, older, running a business, how has it affected you in either a positive or a negative way? A great question. Um, I wasn't on the, in the former camp. I was in the latter. And so, or wait, did I say that right? Anyways, not that the money wasn't tight for our household. I'm sure that part of it probably was, but it was never really openly dialogued and discussed. And I was thinking about this question last night because I was thinking, all right, maybe he's going to ask me this question. And looking at my childhood, I mean, I've been working since I've been 10 years old. I had a paper out back when papers were still a thing. Delivered it 363 days a year. You'll love this one, uh, Cameron. I actually drove a snowmobile, Skidoo, around my neighborhood and drew, delivered the papers because there was like two feet of snow on the ground uh, one day. And it was like, it was minus cold. Uh, let's put it that way. And my dad didn't want to get up and drive me to help me out. He's like, I just take the sled. I'm like, all right, sold. I mean, like, imagine, like, I think I was like 12 years old, 13 years old at that time. And you just like, over there just. Oh, I'm just having a great time. And so, I mean, it was also like 630 in the morning. So I had to be a little bit cautious and a little bit careful by making too much noise. But I remember one, one, one story. And so I've always had the an ability to uh, earn money from, an, from a young age. And so money was something that I've always had and understood except for this one time i don't remember how old i was maybe 11 12 13 um and uh i well i had money in my bank account so i went to the radio shack that's also dating me a little bit here uh when radio shack was still a big thing it was in our small town and i bought this phone for a landline for my room even though i really didn't need a phone in my room but it was a car and it honked whenever somebody called <laughs> I bought it, I plugged it in, and I told my friend to run home and call so I could see it, hear it honk. My mom heard this thing honk, and she watched and She's like, what is that? I'm like, what's a phone? She's like, you don't need a phone. Like, how much did you spend on it? And I told her the price. I don't remember what the price is. She's like, is that something that you really need? Do you really, really need that? Is it something that is going to enrich your life? I'm like, well, yeah, it honks when, I, when somebody calls. It's like, you don't need the phone. You're going to go take it back and you're going to return it and you're going to get yourself a lower, uh, lower cost phone that serves the purpose for what it needs. So not the high end bells and whistles, flute and tootin' thing, right? It was for what I needed. And so I had to go return the phone. And then I came home and she had this used phone in my room. But really when I look at, you know, what it shaped for me is that, okay, you don't need to go out and buy the latest, greatest gizmos and gadgets. And that's a powerful thing for a lot of people because if you, these guys right here, right? Cell phone holding up. Uh, and you think about cell phones. And I know one of my friends, like I swear, for a while there was every six to 10 months, he was getting the latest, greatest phone. I'm like, how much did the cost? He's like, oh, a thousand bucks. What'd you do with your old one? Oh, I'll trade it in. How much did they give you? Oh, like 200 bucks. I'm like, you're spending $800 on a phone every six months. That's $1,600 in a year. You know how long my phone has lasted me for? Three years. You know how much I paid for it? Three hundred dollars because I negotiated with them. So now your sixteen hundred dollars for three years. I mean, let's run the math on that. What's that? Forty eight hundred dollars that he spent on a phone versus my two hundred or three hundred dollars that I spent on a phone. Okay, so that's two hundred or three hundred. Let's make math easy. That's forty five hundred dollars that I have to me that I can use other things for because I didn't go out and chase the latest, greatest gadget, gadget, and giz, gadget and gizmo. And so that's really how I look at how it shaped me is you don't need to go get those, the shiny objects, focus on something that works and does the job in an efficient and effective manner. That's fair. Okay. So it turned out to be a good thing. Yes. Okay. So let's go there. So now in relating that to the clients that you help. So you told us you do HVAC home services, give or take. So, how do you utilize that concept or what you learned from that to best help the client? Because you and I both know 
you know, there's 50 million courses out there every single day. There's always some new tech. Oh, have you heard of this new method? Maybe we should try that for our marketing. You combat all that by doing or saying what? Well, I have a team that handles all of that and they do all those communications. So I'm actually not on, I haven't ran a client facing uh, review call in about a year. Uh, so I, uh, I've done the odd one here and there and it's nowhere near to what we actually do on those calls. I actually don't even know what we do on those calls. To be honest, we have the individuals and the layers in place to be able to do that. I do some of our onboarding and such. And, and really, I, I walk them through, if it were me, if I would put myself in the situation and say, hey, I want to try this out. Uh, and we try to take that partnership approach and have that conversation with them of saying, okay, well, does it make sense for you and your business? Can you afford to do it? Can you have the ability in your uh, profit and loss and your budget to be able to do these sorts of things? And that's the the thing. And I look at you know our business and in how I run our business based off of that lesson is making sure that, okay, let's look at my, my, my general ledger monthly or even every two months and do a deep dive and saying, Hey, do we actually need these things? Right. And crossing what? them off. Not a business account. owner looking at their finances. See, right. They exist. y'all. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but but it, so this is also a very common theme since, you know, we're talking financials here today and, and kind of what you guys do. And I'm assuming the audience of the podcast is that when you look at the financials, I think a lot of business owners forget about what's a kill and a keep. We had somebody pretty big in our space, um, went through a business and we happened to be the marketing company. Uh, luckily we made the keep list, not the kill list, but he went through and he did this exercise of keep and kill. What do you actually need to go through and keep and kill in your business? And I look at this and saying, okay, well, if I'm having a conversation with a business owner and we're talking budgets, what do you need to keep? What do you need to kill? What's actually going to make the, the, the difference for you? What are your actual financials telling you? Like you don't need to open up your entirety of your books, but what is your gross, your, your gross profit on your jobs? Do you know what you're hitting for your gross profit? Do you know what your net is at the end of the day? Your, your EBITDA, if you want to go that route um, and talk that, you know, do you know what those are? And making sure that you also understand your cash flow. And so those are some of the things that I think a lot of business owners forget about and when we're having those conversations to say, hey, you got to also make sure that you're not blowing your budget. See, he's talking my language. I feel <laughs> love. Yes, because we do that same thing with our clients, right? Because it's to your point, it's so easy to just, I need this. Oh, new software came. Yeah, we can integrate that. And next thing you know, you have all this extra stuff and fluff that doesn't really help you. And yes, we keep saying it, that the numbers tell the story. And so I think what's important for you guys as agencies to understand is that that's telling you that's important to know these numbers, not just for your business, but so that you can look at your client and holistically help them. Like, why would we try to give you a 15K a month marketing package with the whole full everything, but that's not what your budget can support? We'd rather give you the 5K package, let those leads come in, and then that'll help solve some of these other problems. So learning how to read these financials and the stories that it's telling you is important, not just for you, but for your, for your clients as well. Because my guy saying financials, income statement, he using all the terms. <laughs> <laughs> I happen to be in the financial seat for our business. Uh, that's why I uh, and focus on that. And that's, that's why we're... You know, uh, I, I know some of those terms, but you think about one thing I wrote down is marketing package, marketing package equals budget. And that was a smart thing that you said, but you think about this in, in, in your agency and you're sitting down and you're doing your discovery call and sure there's probably some nuances for different niches that, that come up or niches, depending on how you want to say it. I say niches, some people say niches, uh, but when you look at your, your niche that you're in, okay, understanding, <laughs> uh, understand, I speak Canadianese, all right? Uh, the, the, when, you, when you look at your, your discovery call and you're having that initial conversation with a, pers uh, with a prospect, do you ask them what their goals are? Do you ask them what their top line revenue goal is for 2024 or 2025 or whenever you're, you were, you, you know, you're in and forecasting that out whenever you're listening to this podcast? And do you ask them what they did the, the previous year or, and what they're on pace for? Right? Because when you have this and you can understand the top end revenue, now you can say, okay, well, if you're a million dollar per year uh, plumbing and HVAC business, all right, well, you don't need the top end package unless you're forecasting to be a $10 million per year business at the end of the first year. But do you, wait, I see where you're going with this. Do you think they can even ask that if they don't even understand those things for their agency? 
No. I don't think so. Uh, and you have to have a, some sort of a financial outlook, right? And <clears throat> I think you and I were messaging about this is that 2024 is the first year that our, our business has had a budget. <laughs> Four years in business. First year we're putting a budget in place. We're just happy you started. It's about how you how you finish, not how you start. Right. And you now, granted, I've always, I've kept a lot of it in my head in terms of making sure that we're doing a profit first and paying ourselves and, and knowing what's coming down the line because we're all monthly recurring revenue and forecasting out some of the revenue that's coming in. And it was all done up in, up in here. So, I mean, I had a budget. It was just never done on paper. Uh, in a sense, and but it was kind of a hodgepodge, right? But if you have that 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 um, forecast and you can put that in place, now you can have a better conversation with them. Now, if you transition that to a salesperson, and now you're no longer the owner doing the sales, well, how do you get your salesperson on board to also understand those things? Well, open some of your books up, I and mean, you don't have to show them exactly everything. But <clears throat> if you talk in percentages. And you show them what it takes and you give some education on there, you're probably going to empower your salesperson to have a better conversation and educate them to have a better conversation with the business owner. Same thing with your your client success specialist, if that's the way that your organization is set scared, up. Right? That, that's, that's typically, when they get to us, at least they're scared because it's, yeah. well, I think mine is the worst ever in history. Like, don't judge me. And then to your point, though, I don't think they actually understand their own numbers enough to even go to the sales team and say, hey, you see how I did it like this? This means this, this. I don't think they even have that kind of confidence or let alone the ability to do that. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> you know what? Fair. But so, but OK, so here's here's a good like if we're, we're on that, you know, that wavelength and you're like, well, you don't have the ability. OK, well, where can you get the ability? Where can you learn how to do that? YouTube University for starters. Hire Cameron for second. I mean, maybe do that first and then YouTube University. Um, so, so there you go. Shameless plug for yourself uh, in there. But look, there, there's 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 ways that you can learn these things if you want yes. to go about and learn it. And I would highly encourage every single agency owner, if you don't know what a GL, a PL, a GP, and a EBITDA, and an NI is when I say that, you probably like I'm not, and I'm not a financial guy. I, I I have a business degree that was a generalist of everything. I think I took one financial course and two accounting courses in university. I knew what gap was, right? Uh, that was about it. Um, but I understood those things, right? So if you don't know what those terms are, well, then start googling it, start learning it, start reading about it. Because it, if you're uneducated when it comes to your financials, how can you effectively run a business? You know, I didn't say it. I just want to throw that out there, y'all. I didn't say that. But to his point, um, and I mean, I've said this plenty of times, this is why I think us as a whole, as an accounting industry, have seriously failed the client. Because to your point, all we're doing is just saying, here you go. Like, here's your P. Oh, and every client. Oh, OK, thank you. Like, this is on us. If we're trying to give max value, if you're trying to make sure that AI can't take your job, so to speak, like you have to go above and beyond, explain it, educate the client, walk with them and partner with them. Because I tell all my clients, there's going to come a point in time where you're going to need to make a move and I'm not going to be there. You may need to get a loan or an SBA loan or you got to make some deal or about to buy a business. Like you may not have me right there or I may not be available. I don't know. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to at least a baseline level have understanding of, hey, this is how my contractors work in relation to how much money I make. Or on average, we spend twenty five hundred on tech and subscriptions or my payroll is typically under 40 percent. Oh, this month is at 48 percent. What does that mean? What did I do? Oh, there was a scope creep, et cetera. You have to understand these things on your own. This is my job to teach you. Well, it's probably not, but I take it personal with my clients, at least to try to teach them that so that they're armed and dangerous without me, which makes the relationship better because who doesn't like to be empowered to feel like I know what's going on with my own stuff. But I think the bigger point that that is really trying to drive home, if you don't know it for you, there's no way you can turn around and flip that for your client and holistically help them. It could be your closing is not as good because you're not knowing the numbers and the percentages that you fall in. Like even with us, we know when we sign somebody, we don't want to exceed more than 5% of their total monthly revenue. 
So whatever that package may be, if I can't even think of a number that would get, if like a client that makes 5K a month, that's why we can't really work with them because none of our packages will fit because it's going to just be too much versus if somebody makes 50 grand a month or 75 or 100,000, well, we know that our fees are going to be lower than 5%. So hypothetically speaking, you saying you can't afford us is not a true statement. That would imply that there are other things stopping you. So that, I mean, what he said. But I just but, want to but, keep but, going back to that. Yeah, but even, I- but even you look at that and saying, okay, we're talking about education on your on your financials and understanding your you know your general ledger, your, your balance sheet, your profit loss, your cash flow, all these things. You don't need to be an expert. Here's the thing is you don't need to be an expert. You can find people that can be an expert for you. It's like a eh, lawyer, for example. I mean, would you write your own uh, contracts and your shareholders agreements? Or if you had to go to They're court? They're going to say yes because chat GPT can do it. Right. Now everybody's a lawyer, right? Um, but it might not necessarily be right for your business, right? And so I had this conversation with a lawyer the other day and, and we're working on something for one of our employees. And, you know, yeah, I could probably go to chat GPT and spin it up. Um but does he know the business and does it get what we want to get accomplished done, right? And so if you don't know the legal background of things, you just say, hey, ChatGPT, legalize this for me. They're going to set, they're going to spit it out. And it could be good. It could be bad. It could be state laws, right? It could be federal laws. It could be provincial or, or you know, uh, laws if you're in Canada. So understanding the nuances and the deep rooted things on it, it's just like uh, your accountant, right? When you look at your taxes and what you need to file, Right. There's uh, if you're doing business in uh, every single state in the U.S., do you know what your threshold is before you have to start charging tax on what you sell? Right. So there's all these things that are that are nuanced, that are deep educational things where you can hire somebody to know that. But you need to have at least a working understanding of what's happening on your financials. You don't have to have as deep knowledge as, as, let's say, myself. But you should be able to read it and understand what it's telling you. Like, I don't know how to, comp- I don't know how to work QuickBooks. I don't know how to put, I don't know how to create my general ledger or spin up my prop, my P and L inside QuickBooks. No, I have the bookkeeper that does that for me, but I know how to read the, the data that's coming out of it and understand what's happening inside my business. And he's not an accountant and I did not know he was going to say this and I did not pay him to say this. So I'm just, well, it's it, but it's, but it's truth, right? And I mean, to be clear, because, you know, we we like to do this because, you know, that I've learned some people are like, oh, you know, who is this guy talking? And you know how people get like, mm-hmm. let me put it this way. If they're on the podcast, we have verified them. We have fact checked them. More than likely, they've been referred to us by a very reputable source or colleague or friend or mentor. So all I'm going to say is that, you know, I ain't bragging. I ain't telling a man business, but he ain't making a hundred thousand a year. I'm going to just throw that out there because, you know, I know some people, oh, who? this is somebody who is doing it at a high level that has been doing it, as he's told you, four years now. It's not like he came out the gate knowing all of these things, but he put in the time to learn. He's driven enough to educate himself or pair himself with the right people, and he's willing to be challenged. That's how you get to the million-dollar agency, not by just doing, ah, I guess this will work, or I'll figure it out, or whatever, but Mm-hmm. I'm just throwing that out there, y'all. And I'm we just... are, we are, by the way, a seven-figure agency. I mean, I don't need to go into exact revenue numbers, but we just finished up our year end already for 2023. Our calendar year ends December 31st, and I just said, yeah, everything looks good. Bookkeepers, away you go, uh, because we're reviewing it every month. <laughs> so when it comes to year end, it's literally I review one month. 
and then, oh, hey, look, year end's done. Uh, it's actually a wonderful thing to just do it monthly. Um, but instead of doing it yearly, I have a hold co that I do it yearly in. And it's, uh, <laughs> I should probably not do my hold call yearly. I should probably do it at least quarterly, um, maybe at like minimum biannual because it makes the year end a little bit easier. But like we're, we're here, like we're, we're doing uh, a seven figure business and our margins were pretty healthy. So I'm just saying people like that are the people you need to connect to. Now, let's go there because we know that for some people, they think it's hard to attain or maybe that's their goal but I'm not quite sure how I'm going to hit it. Let's talk about your team. So how many people do you have on your team? Uh, 17, maybe 18, 17 or 18. So 17 to 18 people across all different functions. So A, don't think you can get to a million dollar agency by just doing it all on your own because not possible unless you want to. I mean, I guess if you're not married, don't have kids, you don't do anything else, work 16 hour days, and even then I'm still not sure. It's nice, it's impossible. Our team members work 200 and some plus hours in a, in a week. So in other words, he telling you, you need help. Yeah. So tell us about how you've grown your team because four years, some people may say that's really fast to get there. So how have you grown your team over time? Tell us like, some of the characteristics you're looking for, some of the things that you found in your hiring process that maybe helped you find elite talent versus average um, and how you got to that 17 or 18 number. Perfect. Um, yeah, it's tough to do it by yourself. Uh, I mean, you could white label it, I guess, and then you could do it by yourself, but then that's not actually, mm -hmm. eh, it's kind of shady. Um, not really though. There's some great people that white label parts of their business. I shouldn't say it's shady. Let me walk that back. Um, it's just a different type of a business model. And I think the uh, businesses out there, depending on your niche, are starting to get a little bit more savvy um, to say, okay, well, is it in-house or is it, do you farm it out, right? And you're keeping it in-house. So our story to, to getting to the size that we had is actually super unique. And we started the business four years ago. Um, and I remember quitting my job <laughs> on the call. I got, they, they offered me a, a bio package. He, my, the CEO asked, Hey, what do you want to do? I want to start, I, run my, I want to run my own business and I don't feel I'm really doing that here. Uh, it was like an independent contractor relationship. He's like, okay, great. Well, here's an offer. I, here's your money. Uh, you can leave. And I said, great. <laughs> my wife comes out. She, she was on the phone. She's like, I think I need to end my, this call guys. I think my husband just quit his job. So, uh, it's like, we knew this, we knew it was coming, but fast forward, <laughs> it was, <laughs> it was, I mean, we knew it was coming. I was going to work it, uh, my job while I worked on the business when I first started right. it to be able to get some sales and some reps under about. And then, and then look, we, we landed five clients within a week of me doing that and then four weeks later COVID hit or five weeks later COVID hit and we lost four of our five clients like it was crazy it was just an insane time oh, wait we got paused so. tell us about wifey so now at this point I'm hopping off the call you say babe let's do it we all in is she happy excited or is she like oh gosh. both uh both so she's um very much uh like salary secure uh is is and by the way there's nothing wrong with that either if you you know you could be you you might want to be salary and secure you don't want to be a business owner you don't want to take that leap you don't That's want to work okay. on commissions all right. it is okay it takes all sorts of people to run the world and she knows that i've always been since literally 2005 and i've and i went the employee route and salary and i just wanted to be able to control my own destiny uh, and be able to to create something where i could not work 40 hours a week for somebody else and work 60 hours a week for myself. I'm kidding. I don't work 60 hours a week. I value work-life balance with my family. I got two young kids, um, but she was really supportive behind it. And we made sure that we had enough uh, in the bank for um, six months, I think is what we gave it. Uh, there was a set timeline then that we talked about. It was like, you got to be knowing that it's going to go somewhere or not within six months. And obviously COVID hit. Um, we we extended that, that window a little bit just because of COVID. Like, let me tell you, Cameron, it was, I was in a pretty deep, dark place during COVID. Uh, I think a lot of people were, but I mean, I just started a business. Uh, we landed five clients. We're working on, you know, learning everything. And then we lost four or five clients and my income went. <laughs> Luckily the government was, was handing out subsidies at that time that you didn't have to pay back. So it kind of helped out a little bit, but I remember there was a four week period of time where I just didn't do nothing. I didn't do a thing. Like it was, it was deep and it was dark. I had to pull out of it. I'm like, no, I got to go out there and I got to go through this and I've got to control what I need to do in order to be able to 
I mean, we didn't have any kids at the time, like for my future. Right. And so pulled myself out of it and in down we went and now here we are um, uh, four years later as a, as a seven figure business. But there was a point in time where we wanted to shortcut some of our growth. Mm. And so we looked at, yeah. So we looked at a business partnership and he had a, uh, I uh, love the person, by the way, I'm um, not going to mention any names, still a great conversation, still a great uh, left in an amicable terms, but we brought in a uh, partnership into our business and uh, in exchange for his fully in-house team and hired some people to be able to fit in our agency. And there was you know, the, the process in there, they were ours, right? And we just, we paid his company and he paid the team out. Um, and so that was part of the relationship. Six months in, seven months in, it just wasn't working out. Team wasn't bought into us. There was problems and just identifying all these things. And so we went from white label in one employee to you know, 12 employees or whatever, to being at uh, 55K per month in MRR and going from a full team to no team. As in, wait, all 12 of them left? Yeah, they're like, well, because the we, we decided to buy the business partner out. <clears throat> So well, now this it's is, just this back is done. to you. It's just back to me and my business partner, Evan. Uh, so I do have a business partner. His name's Evan. He handles, you know, some other things inside the, in the inside the business. I'm more on the financial side. He's more on the sales and marketing side. Um, so I'm like HR and financial. He's sales and marketing. And uh, we were both doing sales for a while. So anyways, we're 55K. Yeah, shout out to Evan. So uh, 55K MRR. Mm -hmm. And we go from uh, 12, 13 people or whatever it was uh, to, to, to none. And then we're like, well, shit, we have no processes. Right, there's no SOPs. We've got no documentation. We don't know how to build any of the shit because there was team leads involved that were handling the team. Sorry, I know I shouldn't swear. Um, but so we 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 had that, and we're like, well, what do we do? So we start hiring people. <laughs> All right, well, let's start with you know a couple. And and luckily through the through the the breakup process, we were um, we had a couple people that we identified. He's like, well, I can't, you know, I've already transitioned someone over to somewhere else, and yada yada yada. I'm like, well, these are the people that we want to be able to take with us. And he said, great, cool. You can take them with you. Um, so we ended up bringing them over into our, into our business. So we had a few uh, that were there that were kind of familiar, but we, we had to go back to white label uh, at that mm. point in time. And it was, I, I didn't like it. And we don't, it was, it was a part of our business that, you know, we'll talk about because especially for agencies that understand it. So we had to build everything at 55 K MRR. I'm talking mm. everything, man. Like we had, we systems, barely had anything. We had, we had, processes. We had systems, processes, everything. And so that was, uh, when was that? So this is after COVID. So we're talking well, yeah, 20, we're like 22, 2023. Um, so a little 20, bit 22. into last year. Yeah. 2022 is when, uh, summer 2022 is when I think it happened. Yeah. Summer 2022. Cause it wasn't last summer. So summer 2022 is when it happened. And so it was like, well, man, yeah, we got to build a team. Okay. How'd you do it? nose down worked hard luckily i had a recruiting background and so i knew how to hire some people i knew how to do these things and you know what we made some mistakes we hired some poor people because they had a pulse <laughs> and they were one tell of the few people that came through mistakes. right because you know that's a whole well i asked that separately tell us the mistakes and then we'll come back to overseas versus local hiring yeah great um the the mistake I think a lot of people make is not making sure the person is a, a cultural fit with your business and defining your culture and what you want it to make, what, what you want it to be. So we now um, uh, interview partly for skill, mainly for culture. If they fit the culture and they have the skill, they've won, right? And now, it, it, so we're we still are looking for some skill behind it, but we could we can teach things, right? If they have the mindset to be able to do it. In fact, one of our developers, uh, web developer, who's now our team lead, he actually was rejected after his second interview. I sent him email saying, hey, no thanks, um, because he lacked. Great person, phenomenal mindset, but we needed somebody that had experience in WordPress. And so I, I declined him and he was new. He had like six months worth of experience in WordPress, built a couple sites by himself and, and that was it. Uh, he actually emailed back and said, hey, you know what? I, I get it and that's your decision. I was really bummed. I was really looking forward to it. Just out of curiosity, um, just so I can prepare for my next interviews, what could I have done better or different or learn to be able to get a job somewhere else? <laughs> Let me repeat that. He asked what he could learn, what he could have done differently so he could be better to get a job somewhere else. What do you think I did? I reached back out to that guy and I said, okay, let's have a third interview. 
let's have a conversation. Let's lay it all out on the table. And I straight up told him, he's like, I get it. He's like, I won't let you down. He's like, I'm going to go and do it. Now he's our team lead. <laughs> so he must have came back on his third interview and said something that just flipped the switch for you, apparently, because he was just a no. The willingness to learn. The willingness to grow. Ah, yeah. Okay. Right? And so willingness to learn. So willingness culture. To culture. Willingness, willingness, to, willingness learn. to learn. Willingness to learn and exceed in matching your the core values. And so I'm assessing when I ask questions. One of the first questions that I ask people in an interview is, Describe yourself in the third person. <laughs> That's probably funny. It, it's hilarious because it, people's faces are like, um, uh, yeah, and then they go right, and and it's and it's interesting to see the people that adapt to it really quickly that are on board with it because we want to throw change, right? That's a that's a change question, right? Are you willing to adapt to things that aren't in the normal? And when the interviews are done, people always say, well, you asked me questions that I didn't prepare for. I'm like, yeah, because that's the point of the interview, right? It's to catch you off that's guard. Right? The second question I ask is what motivates you? Why do you do what you do? And if people don't say, if people say money, they're generally not motivated by money. Very few percentage of the individual in the population are actually motivated by money, but they're motivated by impact. They're motivated by their why. They're motivated by their family more often than anything else. So that's also part of it, right? So now you've understood, okay, well, what's driving them to be better, plus their willingness to adapt to change. And then we throw a bunch of different cultural based questions that are kind of designed to align people with our core values. Um, and that's it. And, and now leading up to this interview, though, by the way, we do run them through a, a, a it's like a, a, so they have the application, right? So if they see it on LinkedIn or Indeed or whatever, they go to a hiring funnel, they do a, a quick apply, name, you know, like info, internet speed, what do you do for fun sort of stuff, right? Uh, they submit that in, it gets bounced to another page, which is their app, which is a questionnaire. Then we actually ask them a whole bunch of questions based off of their role. Okay. At the end of that, uh, sorry, I forgot the one step, before they do the application, there's a video. It's, it's like a minute and a half, two minutes, where Evan records, hey, you know, cultural fit, yada, 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 tells them a secret passphrase that they have to remember at the end. So when they're at the last question of their questionnaire, they have to say the passphrase from the first video, and if they don't get it and they don't write it down, it automatically declines them because they didn't pay attention to detail. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> these are some nuggets, man. These are some nuggets. Uh, the other part of what we've added into this. And so there's also another one too, where we ask them because now we're moving into a place with our business is that we want to, we needed to bring on people that had experience, right? We, we, we brought in some of the newer, new, newer folks, newer individuals, and they just, they, they didn't, they didn't, make it right so we're paying more to have the people with experience and so now right. depending on the role it's two three years usually minimum experience doing it so if they don't answer the the two to three years depending on the role it also declines their their their, their questionnaire and i don't see it okay so those are two automated steps that we put into our recruiting process because a lot of times people will speed apply thinking that they have the experience and they answer it truthfully, which, okay, sorry, you answered it truthfully, but now you're gone, uh, right, uh, from from the process. Or maybe you lied and then we get on the interview, right? But we moved into a place of needing experience from where we're at. Now we're at a place where we might reduce that that threshold from like three years to maybe a year, for example. But the third part of it is that, um, so you mentioned earlier overseas or, you know, uh, near shore, yeah, or offshore. Be because um, that's huge, offshore, right? Yeah. Because... There are a lot of people like, oh, just get you an account manager from overseas or just get you a project manager. And I'm like, before we do that, <laughs> we need to make sure that that's the right fit. I know it's cheaper, but is this really going to solve the problem? Because are they going to help you get to the million dollars? Or like we were talking to a client this morning, he wants to get to two million. You can't hire anybody just so you get to two million. They has to be the right mm -hmm. person the right availability, do they have the right care, all the stuff you just mentioned, or else you're going to hire them, waste time training them, they're going to be here for a short amount of time, you're going to get frustrated, and then we're having a conversation again of, dang, Cameron, this didn't work out, now I need another one. Right. So yeah, what are your thoughts on hiring a local or national or remote person that's in your country versus going to either Philippines, Latam, India, wherever. Right. Uh, great question. Uh, three good employees equals one great employee. Three good team mm. members equals one Facts. good team member, whatever you want to call it. And so when you hire three average individuals, mm. you can hire one rock star and they will do the same work as three good people. 
to pay the rockstar but a little bit more. Say right? the rockstar is so expensive though. I didn't want to pay ninety grand just for that position. I think that was mm-hmm. too high. So then look offshore uh, or near shore, right? And so you look at okay, uh, let's take an average number. I mean, we're in the agency space. We know that roughly when you're when you're doing LATAM or Philippines, I mean fifteen hundred dollars per month, give or take. A thousand, back. really? That's back. Right? Give or take a thousand. Um, you look at, uh, you know, North America based, that same $1,500 is probably five, six grand, right? Uh, and so you, if you, but if you think about it, if you wanted to look at, okay, I'm going to go to Latin America, for example, and by the way, most of our hiring is all based in Latin America, except for our client facing team and our operations team. Uh, they're all North American based. Uh, we have a few Philippines. Uh, we're moving a lot away from the Philippines and more to LATAM for time zones. Um, and then uh, I'll talk about something else. Here, yeah, some great, people. great people, right? Uh, but you think about uh, if you were to have a rock star that might cost you two thousand dollars per month, okay? But you hired, so you got to pay a little bit more. But you want to start mm-hmm. at a thousand dollars a month. But now you have three good people, a thousand dollars a month, so that's three grand versus one rock star at two. That doesn't work with the three. You're actually ahead by paying more. I would agree. And you're going to get better ROI, better product, better fulfillment, probably a better or higher skill level, probably more experience, probably someone who is super serious and dedicated to what they're doing because they know that, like you said, the average is 12 to 1500 and I'm getting paid two grand. So I already know, can't come in half step and playing around like they're bringing me here to be excellent. And to your point, it just saves a lot of headaches. I mean, and think about it, even I'm sure with your agency, there's a reason why you charge what you charge. We're not just saying, oh, pay us five or 10K a month just because like there's a certain quality that you're going to get paying us because you probably have had a bad experience with another agency where, well, I was just paying them a thousand dollars. Well, you got thousand dollar level results. You come pay us five or 10K. Hey, it's it's a reason why we've been out here four years and we can't stop growing. It's a reason why we're top tier. And I think it's so hard for some people going back to that beginning story about the money mindset. Right. Like if you grew up your whole life being cheap, you become a business owner. You can't do that anymore. Well, you can. It's probably going to take you a lot longer to get where you need to be. Or you get around to people like that who's like, hey, we got to spend this money. But it's gonna it's gonna benefit you. It's gonna help you. It tells this story. Right. So that's think about it this way: million dollar business, and let's just say for the sake of of clarity that you have twenty percent EBITDA, so you're twenty percent net income. Uh, you're paying out eight hundred thousand dollars per year in expenses. Stop right there. Tell them. Go. Go. Never mind. Go. Go. Because I know what you're gonna say. Go. <laughs> Right. Uh, and so you think about the, cause you mentioned that the cheap mindset, right? You can't have that when you're a business owner, you have a lot of expenses. A lot of people can't fathom it either. And in like, maybe you're listening to this and you want to draw that level and you're like, mm, you know what? Okay. Maybe actually I don't want to spend $800,000 in expenses on a yearly basis. Maybe I only want to spend 10,000. Okay. You think, think great. There's nothing wrong with that. Knowing the business that you want to become and the business that you want to be at, you could be an agency that wants to stay at 10 clients. You could be an agency that wants to stay at 50. You could be an agency that wants to stay at 100. You could be an agency that wants to exit for eight figures, right? But knowing what you want and then also reverse engineering it. But when you think about this $800,000 in expenses and this cheap mindset, and you think about pricing yourself and making sure that you're hitting hitting that, you know, five to $10,000 per month or 3,000 or 5,000 or 1,000 or whatever your prices are, reverse engineer it. How much do you, for your team, right? And so you look at this in the budget and okay, well, let's reverse engineer for a second. If I know that I need to or want to hit, um, you know, my team being, my cost of goods sold being 50%. Okay, well, keep your cost of goods sold at 50%, knowing what your cost of goods sold are in there. And you want to have uh, a 20% for your um, your overhead, including some of your, your leadership and your operational team. And you have a 30% net. Rough numbers, don't hold me to those. I'm just going off the top of my head. Okay, well, what do you need to charge in order to be able to hit those numbers? That's a big exercise. And and uh, if you don't know the financials to come full circle back to that, then you probably yeah. need to have somebody to be able to help you walk through that, to be able to do that for your business. Now, see, he, dad, killing it right now, y'all. So 
The other part that he didn't say was think about it too. When you're talking about money mindset, go back to that. I want you to hit this one for me. Now, notice what he said. They're making a million dollars. I'm spending 800. People often don't even get to the part that you have to spend to make the million. They just say, bro, I just, I want to make the million dollars. I want to get to the million dollars. You have to spend 800,000. How can you spend? Thank you so much. Um, this is what happens when you forget to eat. <laughs> you should have seen me shuffling pay, the food before this. I was like, oh man, I went call to call to call. I'm just like, you could have ate it on here. Yeah. So, you know, think about it. If you have never even seen 800,000, you have to spend 800. That in and of itself is a, is a, I don't know if you want to say a stumbling block or a big thing of pressure because they're like, whoa, I got to do what? But that's the cost of business. That's why it's important to get around people like that and some of the people that we know, because that's just what it is. You you can't make a million and think you're only going to spend a hundred thousand. Right. If you do, everybody in the world will want that business plan. Well, so and, and I luckily, um, I mean, Cucko Knife, shout out, shout out Cucko, shout out Effective Marketing uh, for th this lesson, because you, your money is not somebody else's money, right? Your money mindset isn't somebody else's money mindset. And this comes from Cutco. I was 19 years old, 20 years old, whatever it was, and selling a $1,200 set of kitchen knives. That was the that was the like the set that we started with. You know, it was the $1,200 set of kitchen knives. Can you imagine any 19 year old in their right mind that would spend $1,200 on a set of kitchen knives? I, I don't know a no, single the one. They're like, they're going to go to the dollar store and they're going to buy yeah. the cheapest thing that they could possibly do because they're 19. Right. Correct. And so, and so the priorities of money are completely different for individuals. So you think about this Cutco example. And one of the things that we used to do when we, when we did the, the training and in, in teaching other individuals, this exact same concept was okay. And this is by the way, 2005. So we didn't have what we have today for some of the technology. There were still CDs and there's still DVDs, right? I think the, the, the iPod was just coming out, uh, in 2005, right? My iPod that right? Me down. Uh, so I had an iPod, um, and I'm so I was trying to think when the iPhone came out and started to really become prevalent. It was like 2000, like seven or eight or something like that. I don't know. Anyways. So it was like 2004, 2005. And you had to do this example of saying, okay, well, your money is not their money. Right. You look at a household who's dual income, they're 50 years old and, you know, they've got expenses, right? They've got a mortgage, they've got these bills, they've got this, et cetera. And so one of the extras is, okay, great. Who loves music? Somebody who always undoubtedly raised their hand because it was a group training and somebody like, great. Well, how much was your guitar or how much was your piano or your violin or whatever you play? And they're like, $2,000. And you somebody who doesn't like music or play music, right? And like me, it's like, would you spend $2,000 on a guitar? Hell no. Right. Who has a, who loves music? Okay. Somebody wants to put their hand up. Okay, great. Well, how many CDs do you think you have? People say, Oh, I have at least hundred CDs. Okay. Great. It was the average cost $10. So you've got a thousand dollars worth of CDs. Who else would spend a thousand dollars on CDs? And people are like, no, no, no way. No way. All right. Well, DVDs. I had a friend who had a DVD collection of 200 DVDs. That shows how good it does him now. <laughs> Whatever. Um, his average cost for his DVDs was like $15. Okay, well, who's going to spend that much money, 200 DVDs times $15? Not me. The person who really enjoys said thing. Right, and the person who really enjoys said thing, but also the person who has that priority around what they want to be able to spend money on. And so when you look at the business side of things, well, how does this relate? It goes back to that $800,000, right? You have to understand the different sides of running a business. And if you were to sit down with somebody, you say, yeah, I spend more money in a month uh, on expenses than you make in a year. Some people just don't comprehend that. And that's okay, by the way, that's okay. But if you okay. want to grow to this seven, this seven figure business, this million dollar agency, and you might be stuck at this limiting belief that, you know, I don't want to spend money to make money. You have to get rid of it. Cause you look at hey, in, in heck, look at some of the even bigger and the larger organizations that are, that are batting 5% net. So if you take an, uh, an, an organization that's, let's say, $10 million and they're, they're hitting a 5% net, because some businesses, they're, they're, they're net, their EBIT is low, it's 5%. Okay, well, what are they spending in expenses? A the lot answer of is a lot. Yeah, tech, 
uh, human payroll and salaries. Mm-hmm. Man, mm-hmm. that's crazy. So just understanding that and in wrapping your head around that concept is super impactful, I think, for people that might be struggling to get to that seven figure number. Oh my gosh, time has flown. What the heck? Okay. Sorry, I kind of went on a long tangent. So this was crazy. Okay, let's wrap this up because we know you got to go save the world the whole night. Um, let's go rapid fire with some of these questions. These are some of the, the, the funny questions, the fun ones. So rapid fire, here we go. What has been your best investment to date that's giving you the best ROI in your opinion? Myself. That is a great answer. Okay. What are some things that you choose to do with Bay and the kids like to connect throughout the week? Um, whether it's like, like in our case, we do pancake day every Saturday. Is there something that you and wifey do or you and the kids do to kind of keep that work-life balance? Uh, breakfast and supper every day together. That's hey, solid. All yeah, right. I love, I love the fact of being able to sit at the table every single day at the end of the day uh, and have uh, a meal. I mean, my kids are young. They don't understand it quite yet. But when all four of us sit there, having, sometimes breakfast doesn't always happen because of when the kids wake up. But supper together as a family with no technology there you go are you are you a do lunch with the kids and wife type person or no if my schedule allows what i work from home uh, and if there's an opportunity for me to pop out and have lunch with the kids uh and the wife then yes if not then no like today i ate lunch in three minutes at my desk so same all right how has your definition of success changed from when you started four years ago to present day Time freedom. That's today's definition? That's today's definition. Versus it was? Money. To pay the bills. Pay the bills, yeah. It was, now it's, you know, it's freedom of time. That's my next, that's my next transition. That's my next chase. All right. If you could go back in time to your college or high school self, let's say you have five minutes you knew every single thing that you know, like present day right now to this second. What would you go back and tell college Thad or high school Thad? High school Thad would be don't go get a business degree, go into the trades. And then work in the trades and start a business in the trades. What about college Thad? Uh, if you're in the STEMs, science, technology, education, math, okay, you got a place. Uh, most of schooling, in my opinion, is – let's just put it this way. I graduated with a C- minus average in business, uh, in my business degree, and I know friends who don't even work in business now after getting a business degree. <laughs> so it's one of those floor, throwaway degrees. College, again, depending on what you're going after, right, depending on what you're wanting. If you're in the STEMs, then great, go for it. Uh, if you want to run a business – you don't need to go to university or college to run a business. You think you could, Ooh, that's a good one. Dang it. Now we got to stay here. You think that you could skip college and still be a successful business owner. Just if you go straight into the workforce. Today's day. And outside age, yes. of, of course, a few, yeah. like if you're a doctor, you need to go, but yeah. outside of those. Doctors. Yeah. Today's day and age. Yes. Look, look hey. How much knowledge is out on the internet right now? I mean, like I went to university, I went to college in 2003. Okay. So you kind of date myself a little bit, but you know, <clears throat> Google was barely there. You couldn't just pull out your phone and Google something and quest for knowledge. You had to go learn it. So, okay. There was a time maybe at that time to be able to do that. But so much of what I know and running my business hasn't actually come from my textbooks. It's come from real world experience. All right. It's came from real world experience. I might, I might say that my financial side of things and my knowledge around some of that and the basic understanding did come from my university degree because I did some financial courses and I did some accounting courses. So I understood the general principles of it. Doesn't mean I know how to still go back to my quick look example, right? I still know the basics of it. <clears throat> But with the technology, but you know what it should and shouldn't look like. Correct. And so, knowing what is out there for technology today, there is so much knowledge out there. Like mm-hmm. this thing, this cell phone was is more powerful now than a computer to me was in two thousand three. I feel that right. It's faster, goes with you, yeah. more capabilities. Yep. 
and it's just the knowledge. The knowledge is there. If you want to learn something, you can learn it. You just got to take the, have the willpower and wherewithal to go learn it. So then with your kids, when they get to 18, 19, and what if they say, dad, I don't want to go to college. I just want to work with you because all my life we've had so much fun and I've seen how you're always there and I want that. I will tell them to go get a job, learn some experiences from somewhere else. Yeah. Uh, I'd be like, great, that's fine. I, I will, I will show you your path. I will give you your path to work in the business, but you're going to go learn somewhere else. And I would probably even push them to move to a different city for a couple of years to do it. So in order to get the keys to the kingdom, that's cool, but yeah. I'm going to make you do this long route. First. Yeah, you got to do the long route. And a lot of times I think what happens in, in some businesses and not, not necessarily all, all of them, but um, kids want to come in, they run around the business, they want to learn how to do it. And they want to be there like 20 years old running everything. How many 20 year old, 20 year olds do you know that could possess the intellect to be able to run a seven figure or eight figure business? <laughs> No. Right. And so you have to learn it. Right. And so there's, we've had some, some good guests on our podcast who've taken over the family business and the, the commonalities ring true is that they started at the bottom. You know, one guy had to apply to work in the warehouse of his dad's HVAC and plumbing business. And I think they're electrical too. And they were, they're like a 50, $60 million per year business. He had to apply to go work in the warehouse. That's where he started. He started sweeping floors. If he wanted a promotion, he had to go apply to it just because it wasn't daddy's kid, right? Now he, now he runs the business. He worked his way through up everything, All right? So if you wanted to go the route of, okay, well, at 20 years old or 18 years old, you want to not go to college or university, great, 100% support that decision. You make what's best for you. But if you want to work in the business, you're going to start at the ground. You're going to work your way up. I love that answer. Okay. Uh, what two or three things would you contribute to your success? Like maybe you do them daily like if I don't go to the gym or I don't know, whatever it may be. Mm, um, like a daily success or just overall success? Just two or three things that you would say, like, if I don't do these, okay, it's not going to be a solid day. My answer is going to shock you is that there really isn't much there. Uh, that is to my morning routine at this current moment in time. I will also one thing that helps my mindset. So if I don't do it, I'm, I'm fine. Um, my day still goes about my day, but I really enjoy, uh, quiet in the morning. So I don't check my socials. Don't check anything. I wake up at five 45 by the time I look at my phone at six 30. Um, I mean, I'll look at it, turn the alarm off or whatever, and, and see the weather. If I need to see the weather to determine if I'm going to walk the dog outside when it's cold or my wife is, uh, usually if it's cold, I'm walking it, I'm walking the dog, uh, but then I like quiet and I stretch. That's it. That's, that's the thing. If I can get some quiet and I can do some, you know, 10, 15 minutes of just stretching, I'm better throughout the day. If I don't get that, I'm still good throughout the day. It's just cause it's it, like, I believe that a lot of times it can be your mindset that, that affects that reason. Be like, Oh, I didn't get my morning coffee or I didn't get this and I didn't get that. And my day is ruined. Well, no, you're just choosing to let your day be ruined. Another bomb. All right. There's been a lot what of has those. been a, <laughs> A business owner taught you about yourself as a person. What is a uh, another business or being a business owner taught me about uh, being yeah, a person? Yeah, what have you learned about who Thaddeus the person is because you run a business? That I'm adaptable and resilient. Dang. Okay. All right. Well, here we go. Oh, you know what? No, I got to ask this one because you'll be the perfect person to ask. Top three things you would tell a new marketing agency to not do to hit a million dollars. To not do. Um, so yeah, don't, don't, don't do this. Don't, do this. Gonna, don't yeah, hire yeah. the wrong people or don't. So that's number one. And don't don't cut your corners on hiring that individual. Um, so that's one. Um, you. Uh, I mean, you should understand your financials. So I don't know how to phrase that as like a not do, I guess not know your financials um, is number two. Uh, and number three is don't sell your services for less than what you're worth. And there you have it. All right, this is your time. Tell the people again, name, name a company, who you serve, how they can get in touch with you, whether that's email address, which your preferred socials in case they just want to reach out. If that's a website, if you got like an ebook, lead magnet, whatever, 
I want to partner with that is in some kind of way, whether that's white label or I, I know somebody who needs his help or whatever the case. This is your space. Sure. Thaddeus Tanu, onpurposemedia.ca is our website. Check it out. Um, we have a podcast on there called HVAC Revealed or HVAC Success Secrets Revealed, where we're, we're generally interviewing uh, leaders and disruptors in the HVAC and plumbing uh, home service space to be able to help others grow their business too. We lead from a place of value first. Um, and so if you're like, hey, you know what, I'm really stuck on this, you know, you're, you're there, or I have a question, you know, reach out, hit me up. You can hit me on email. It's Thaddeus at onpurposemedia.ca or send me a message on uh, Facebook Messenger. Uh, I think it's just facebook.com forward slash Thaddeus.tandu uh, is the URL. Those are going to be your two best ways to be able to get in touch with me. All right. Now you see, hey, maybe that is may need to be your mentor. You see, he got the, you see how quick he was just dropping the gym. <laughs> so the, again, we tell you guys all the time, make sure you're connecting with these people that we're bringing on here, not just because they are at that seven figure mark, but because these are people that are great people. These are people who I vetted, who I know, who knows them. So I know they're not going to tell me, oh, take this crazy person on your podcast. Like these are good people. Matter of fact, me and Thaddeus are even in the same mastermind. So there's that whole thing. So I'm telling you, surround yourself with good people. So that way you can open up your brain to learn these new concepts or expand or challenge some of those bad ways of thinking or that bad money mindset. And then you'll you'll be surprised at how much further you can go. So that thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Uh, guys, make sure you like this. Share this with people that you think it would be a great fit for um, that young uh, marketing agency. That's like, man, I want to, there's a perfect one to share right here. A ton of wisdom, a ton of ways to skip some of those speed bumps. This is one of them. So that, thank you again. Until the next time, people, everybody be safe and we'll see you on the next episode of season two.